All right, good morning traders. My name is Christopher Vecchio, Senior Currency Strategist with Daily Effects. Today is Wednesday, April 12, 2017. This is your weekly FX trading Q&A as we discuss our midweek update for what's going on the rest of the week in FX markets in terms of major event risk and the major themes that have been impacting the major currencies here and what we can expect moving forward. As always, if you have any comments or questions, feel free to put them in the chat box at any point in time. If you're looking for trade-specific insight, please include your entry stop and time frame. That way I know where you've gotten into the market, where your risk lies, and of course, what your point of view is. I myself, I'm a swing trader, so I operate on four-hour and daily charts for the most part. So if you were, say, a scalper operating on 15-minute or hourly charts, help me help you by providing me as much detail or color to your perspective or current trade as possible. That way I know I can adjust my analytical framework to help you. Please be aware, however, that any opinion I disseminate is mine and mine alone. It does not constitute trade advice on behalf of Daily Effects or IG Group, so please don't treat it as such. All right, with that said, we are just past the halfway mark this week, as it is already Wednesday, and all things considered, it is a four-day week. Uh, Friday is Good Friday, and so markets in Europe and the U.S. will be closed effectively, meaning that Friday is a non-day in the market, despite the fact that we have some significant economic data out. Um, instead, there are a few things that we're looking forward to ahead of time uh, as we get ready for this holiday Friday that would lead to some more volatility in the market. We're going to concentrate on those items as we check out the calendar. Likewise, we're going to discuss the major themes that have been impacting prices the last few days, including what's going on in geopolitics. But starting off with where we are on the calendar, it's always good to get a review of where we stand the first few days this week. Um, right now, the big thing would be to look out for the Canadian Bank of Canada uh, rate decision, of course, today. That BOC is meeting at 10 Eastern, 14 GMT, and the BOC has been more or less in a neutral tone to start the year. It doesn't appear that the BOC is going to be poised to change rates anytime soon, especially today when market expectations are calling for, with 100% of economists looking for uh, a, a hold, 50%, uh, excuse me, 50 a basis point. Key rate will remain there, despite the fact that recent labor market data has come in consistently above expectations. The key issue for the BOC will be the lack of demand pull inflation, or higher prices resulting from faster rates of consumption. There's two types of inflation, right? There's demand pull, which is the good kind, and then there's cost push, which is the bad kind. Cost push means that uh, producer prices are rising so much, and businesses, because of the rising cost of their inputs, they have to actually pass on the additional price rises to their consumers so that they don't lose money. Demand pull inflation, which is the good kind, is what the BOC is looking for, which they just haven't seen. And that's where demand outstrips supply, and so consumers as a way to, or rather producers as a way to capture that excess consumer surplus uh, uh, they raise prices in turn, and they know that consumers will continue to buy goods despite the hike in prices. And as you know, supply and demand curves are inverse, uh, inversely related. So as prices go up, that should mean demand goes down. But in a demand pull situation, you can see that consumer consumption supports higher prices. Well, we haven't really seen that. Uh, recent figures from the Statistic Canada show that wage growth has remained below plus 2% now, for 28 consecutive months, and overall wage growth is at its lowest level since 1990. So that really doesn't give us a lot to work with today at the BOC. Two-way volatility is more likely than direction the CAD crosses around the BOC. They're going to talk about how the labor market has improved, yet there's this caveat that they're not really seeing the gains passed on through the rest of the economy right now. The economy is still facing a period of uncertainty, particularly given the fact that there could be a, a series of uh, renegotiations with respect to trade coming up, thanks to what's going on with U.S. President Trump and uh, NAFTA, of course. Something that has benefited oil in recent days has been the fact that oil has rebounded rather sharply. We're on quite a little tear here since we bottomed on March 27th, only we've put in two days in which we've traded lower since then. A lot of this has to do with what we've seen out of uh, the Middle East. A lot of this has to do with what we've seen with OPEC. Just yesterday, in fact, Saudi Arabia was calling for OPEC to extend its production cuts. As we know, if supply is going to be reduced, here we go back to that supply-demand equation, if supply is going to be reduced, then the cost of 
the goods will go up as scarcity effects take place. Now you sprinkle in this idea that the United States has now launched missile attacks against Syria, and you could say, okay, well, you know, what does Syria have to do with it? Syria only puts out about 10,000 barrels per day. Um, it's a very small amount of oil that Syria contributes to the international oil market scheme. Instead, it's this geopolitical uh, saber rattling that's going on that if we continue to see pressures move in the direction that they have, the odds of further confrontations with other major oil producers like Iran, for example, would go up. And of course, then we face that timeless question of if we go towards military conflict with Iran, if the United States does that, what does that mean for oil passing through the Strait of Hormuz? Strait of Hormuz is this two-mile-wide band in between uh, uh, Iran and, uh, I guess, Oman and Saudi Arabia. Um, and it's where I believe like 75% of the world's oil passes through on any given day. It's uh, a, a very important, very important part of the global oil trade. So you see that, for example, we have issues where there are military vessels operating in the Strait of Hormuz, then maybe there's going to be a problem with supply for oil to the rest of the world. So there are a few things coming into play here. All right. Geopolitics one. Of course, we're seeing the OPEC production cuts too. And then sprinkle that on top of the fact that you have a weak yield situation in the U.S. and lower U.S. yields and a weaker dollar generally mean demand for inflation hedges like oil. And generally speaking, commodities are great inflation hedges. All right, They tend to go up because if the dollar is going to weaken, then odds are that the cost of imported goods from abroad will be higher. Um, but circling back to the Canadian dollar here, oil prices are up. This is helping keep dollar CAD constrained within this triangle here. US dollar index had rebounded a little bit, going back to the levels that we had seen earlier in March. However, despite the recent rebound in US dollar index, we haven't seen the Canadian dollar uh, uh, turn lower. So we'll want to keep an eye on that for later on today. Again, given everything that's going on, given everything that we're seeing, I'm not inclined to believe that the BOC is going to be anywhere close to moving. They're very much going to be in a wait and see mode. Not looking really for direction today, but more two-way volatility in the Canadian dollar. If we see the Canadian dollar weaken, I really like looking at CAD Yen short. Uh, CAD Yen has been trading in a really clean fashion, in my opinion. The level that we pointed out previously was this 88.90 level or so. Treated as support back in August and September 2015. Once we broke down through that level, though, you could see here how it quickly became resistance on multiple occasions. December 2015, April 2016, more recently December 2016. Clear support turned resistance, and the most recent test resulted us in starting to trade into a flag type situation. Now, what's interesting is that on the way down, we treated the parallel channel as support. And now that we've broken down through the base of that parallel channel, it's been very clear resistance again. Now, I see the alternative outcome here, because I always want to be open-minded to whatever may happen in the market. I see the alternative outcome that maybe we're starting to winnow down into a, a little bit of a, a wedge down here. For now, with the Canadian dollar generally speaking on a weaker footing, and the yen trading to new highs for 2017, I'm inclined to think that the trend is your friend. So provided the opportunity to sell CAD yen if it's a weaker or less optimistic BOC, the odds are better for a move downside. And right now, if we just throw on the moving averages, eight is below 13, which is below the 34. Price holding below all three moving averages here. MACD, stuck in bearish territory. Stochastics likewise. Momentum is firmly to the downside. So despite the recent rise in oil prices, 
we're seeing that CAD yen is falling. Now, when we factor that into the equation and we take a look at what's going on in oil, then it makes us believe that there's this risk sheltering move going on where people are going into oil because they think prices will rise as a safety concern because maybe global trade will freeze up. CAD yen moving lower is a sure sign that the risk off nature of this market is starting to uh, periphery and, and, and spread a little bit more widely. Um, generally speaking right now, when we think about the risk situation and kind of jumping from event risk to overall market themes, with markets closed for the developed world on Good Friday this week, it seems unlikely that market participants will be overtly committed to taking significant positions in any major currency. And right now this is translated into the dollar index more or less running into resistance off the highs we saw in January and, and March and euro dollar coming into support off the same corresponding trend line January 3rd, March 2nd, March 3rd. There doesn't seem to be a strong enough catalyst right now to get past the consolidation thresholds into breakout territories. Even Aussie dollar right now which is sitting at the bottom of we can call it a three month range where it looks like we may be putting in a double top up here aided by the fact that we've seen iron ore come off so substantially in the last few days where we close to today iron ore is down 17 percent from its closing high it's down over 20 percent from its absolute high but iron ore trading lower iron ore being Australia's main export when we take a look at the Australian dollar, one might be inclined to think that Aussie dollar could be topping out. But the fact that we haven't been able to push through this consolidation threshold, the fact that euro dollar remains range bound, and the fact that dollar yen has broken down through its triangle says to me that no one wants to commit to a bullish dollar position full swing yet, but they'd rather take shelter in something like a, a safe haven currency. Typically around holidays, particularly when non-market or geopolitical risks are rising, traders begin to shelter in safe haven assets like gold or the Japanese yen. Put simply, no one wants to be caught holding the bag of risky assets when they won't be at their trade desk for an extended period of time. If we were to throw on a chart of gold here, and we were to put on, say, the inverse of dollar yen, and we were to say to put on the inverse of US yields. Something is clearly happening in this market that's causing correlations to tighten up. Correlations typically tighten up when there's fear and panic spreading because everyone moves in the same direction. When we look at this on a four hour basis since the FOMC meeting, gold, dollar, yen, and 10 year yield have all been doing the same thing. Weaker U.S. yields has been cutting interest rate differentials that support dollar yen. A drive to safety has been helping gold and driving support into the Japanese yen as well. These have been moving in lockstep. Now dollar yen and 10-year yield are inverse on this chart so that they line up with gold's price. But the point remains the same. Something's happening right now. It's driving traders into more safe haven type sheltering trades. Maybe this has to do with the rising geopolitical risk that's going on around the world. I'm very dissuaded from thinking this is directly to do with Syria. One thing that has perked up on my screen the last few days has been the rise of South Korean five-year credit default swaps. Credit default swaps are basically insurance against a credit event like a well, default. What could drive the South Korean government to defaulting on their debt? They've already gone through a little bit of political mishap this year with their president being impeached and thrown into jail. So what's driving 
CDS Hire Now. While the United States has a carrier strike group, the Carl Vinson, heading towards North Korea. There have been reports the last few days that 150,000 troops of the Chinese People's Liberation Army have amassed on the border between North Korea and China on the other side of the Yalu River. It looks, from my point of view, that geopolitics are starting to price in some confrontation between North Korea and the rest of the world. Gold's going up, oil's going up. Japanese investors are bringing capital back home. They're repatriating funds. Investors are taking shelter in U.S. Treasury yields. It's a bad mix of things for dollar yen. When we take a look at what's going on with equity markets, of course, U.S. investors couldn't care less because, hey, tax cuts may be coming, right? <laughs> I'm seeing an interesting situation where we could be looking at an inverse head and shoulders up here, which is not something you typically look at in the middle of an uptrend, but uh, having the last few years looked at these patterns before, and I think they're somewhat reliable. It almost looks like we're carving out a continuation effort to the top side. Now, until then, of course, we want to assume that this trend line will continue to guide us lower. Certainly when we take a step back and look at longer term tax, prices are losing that momentum support from the moving averages. And you can see here how MACD has gotten back down to that signal line and Stochastics has tripped right below 50. So this isn't exactly the most bullish momentum set up right now. Uh, nevertheless, S&P 500 remains immune to some of the concerns going on elsewhere, although the market had fallen yesterday to their lowest level going back since March 27th at one point in time. I'm inclined to think that if gold keeps trailing and the yen keeps trailing, investors will take risk off positions and will jettison U.S. equities heading into the long weekend. Now this weekend is a four-day weekend for Europe. Markets are closed for a good Friday and Easter Monday. However, U.S. markets only closed on Good Friday. It's actually uh, illegal against the law in the United States to have financial markets closed for four days in a row. It's one of those reasons why, you know, around Thanksgiving, for example, U.S. markets are closed on Thursday, and then we have a half day on Friday. Equity markets can't be closed four days in a row. So, as such, we have off Good Friday this year. Markets will be open on Monday. Probably going to be a quiet day, though, given the fact that Europe will be off and... Most everyone I know, not that most everyone I know is the market, but as an anecdote, most everyone I know is taking a four-day weekend. Uh, moving on to other event risks. We were talking about the Australian dollar earlier. Uh, they do have some important figures coming up, right? Australian employment change and unemployment rate are due out. Uh, later tonight in New York or tomorrow morning, UK time, 1.30 GMT on Thursday. Bloomberg forecast suggests that Aussie employment is increased by around 20K in March after declining by 6.4 thousand jobs in February. February's decline was the first month of losses since September. Additionally, the unemployment rate is expected to remain on hold at 5.9%. The uneven pace of jobs growth appears to be a wrinkle in the outlook for the Reserve Bank of Australia, which just last week noted that wage pressures aren't strong enough to provoke a rate hike anytime soon. Interest rate expectations per overnight index swaps show only a 6.7% chance of a rate hike by December 2017, while there is a 22.3% chance of a rate hike, or excuse me, a rate cut coming into this week. So, where does this leave us? Well, you see a weaker labor market report tonight, and this will more or less undercut the Australian dollar, given the stance of the RBA that the labor market isn't in a strong position anyhow. Aussie yen, something that we've been looking at for the last several days, has been getting absolutely slaughtered. 
Um, this is one of the things that we've been reliably looking short on for good reason, I think. The technicals were hinting at us that the uptrend was broken back in February. A very clear pattern emerged here from my point of view. Price holding above that daily 34 EMA on a closing basis since September 30th. We get tests of, but no closes below that daily 34 EMA until we get to February 24th. And we have this lovely bar piercing that on a closing basis. Preceding that bar, we had this uh, key reversal at the high. We've had several piercing bars in between. And sure enough, as the triangles lose support and momentum is quickly lost, we trade below this former support turn resistance zone and prices begin to peel back over. And you can see here how the first interaction with that daily 34 EMA on March 31st ultimately led to prices turning lower anew. Depending upon how you want to look at it, prices below all the major moving averages, MACD, stochastics trending lower. Aussie yen is not in a good situation. Neither is Kiwi yen, which after reaching the target level of 77.20, which was the measured double top against the highs that we saw back in December and January, between 83.70 and 80.45, we've now seen price continue to collapse below there. So that's a bad thing. It's not that this was simply a correction move, right? The market moves as it's doing. It says that there's something else going on. Um, Aussie yen and Kiwi yen are two of the more risk-sensitive pairs given the interest rate differentials there. And so when investors are dropping like flies out of these interest rate sensitive carry trade currencies, carry trade being where you, you know, take a lower yielding currency, you borrow against it, and then you invest the proceeds in a higher yielding currency, thereby capturing the interest rate differential. We're seeing that problems are starting to proliferate in the market. One other thing that's worth keeping an eye on this week as we watch the U.S. dollar index continue to float around within this consolidation uh, is the data that's appearing on Friday. Unfortunately, markets won't be that active, but that doesn't mean that there's not significant economic data coming out because the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the BEA are obviously out of tune with the rest of the world. I mean, you can see that there are three data prints coming out of Japan, or actually two data prints, industrial production and capacity utilization, and then only stuff out of the United States. Everything else is closed. Of course, the United States has to do things their own way, and they'll be releasing two of the more important data releases that are out any given month on Friday, which is unfortunate because it means that A, there won't be a lot of people to react, and B, if there is a significant deviation from expectations, the lack of liquidity will cater to an environment where there's probably a more violent move. Consumer price index due at 2.6% from 2.3%. Advanced retail sales due out looking at negative 0.1% from 0.1% month over month. It's important to keep an eye on these readings as they both constitute significant aspects of what's going on in the U.S. economy. Consumption is the most important part of the U.S. economy, generating nearly 70% of the headline GDP figure for recent reports. The best monthly insight we have into consumption trends in the U.S. might arguably be the advanced retail sales report as such. In March, consumption weakened slightly according to Bloomberg News Survey with the headline advanced retail sales set to decrease by somewhere between negative 0.1 and negative 0.2%. The retail sales control group which is the input used to calculate GDP, is doing at a mere 0.3% from plus 0.1%. Higher consumer confidence after the U.S. elections is not translating into faster growth. That's worth pointing out. U.S. consumer confidence per the Conference Board Consumer Confidence Survey is at its highest level since December 2000. This dissonance, this gap between soft and hard data is something that is haunting the U.S. dollar because everyone is expecting things to improve, but has it actually been improving? No. And that's an issue. That's an issue for markets. That's an issue for the greenback. One of the things that we discussed a few weeks ago was this dissonance between 
hard data and soft data, where soft data figures like these consumer sentiment surveys and ISM business surveys, they were pointing higher. But hard data like retail sales and the trade balance continue to remain weak. That's going to come into focus again this Friday because we've seen again these consumer confidence surveys persist near near 20-year highs, yet it's almost as if everyone's talking the talk but no one's walking the walk. If you're so confident, go out there and buy things, basically, is what the market's saying. We have yet to see that occur. The other side of this, of course, is that consumer uh, uh, price index release, which according to Bloomberg News is looking at a 2.6% increase down from 2.7% previously. Uh, core readings are around 2.3% from 2.2%. These figures have aggregately just started to push through the Fed's 2% medium-term target, which not only means that they should be strong enough to keep the Fed on track to hike rates at least twice more this year, um, but that the Fed may be closer to hiking rates again than what we are thinking about right now. A faster rate of inflation may be the result of the tightening labor market, of course, which just produced a cycle low unemployment rate of 4.5%. A lot of people were saying, well, that unemployment report or labor market report on Friday was terrible. No, it wasn't. I know 98,000 jobs were added per non-farm payrolls. Look, the reporting period for the U.S. labor market was in the week which we had that significant snowstorm that swept through the south and the northeast along the eastern seaboard. Uh, uh, weather unadjusted form of employment says that we probably clo added closer to 275,000 jobs. Plus, you want to factor in the equation that the household employment survey, which the unemployment rate is derived from, there are two labor market figures or two labor market surveys that come out each month. There's the non-farm payrolls report and there's the household employment survey. The unemployment rate is derived from the changes in the household employment survey. So while NFP said 98,000 jobs, household employment survey showed 472,000 jobs. So the unemployment rate falls to a cycle low of 4.5%, while the labor force participation rate holds steady. So we know it's not just you know janky accounting that's producing the lower unemployment readings. In turn, wage growth is at 2.7%, which if it was up at 2.8% would be near a seven-year high. Underemployment rate fell as well. So the Fed thinks that these labor market readings are legitimate. And then you put in the inflation figures here where they're above 2% on the headline and above the core. And now we see that the core PCE is starting to get up there and the PCE is above 2%. PCE being the Fed's preferred gauge of inflation. All of a sudden, we're very much at full employment, medium-term target of inflation. The Fed is going to raise rates again as soon as they possibly can, which isn't May because that's not when the Fed can raise rates again because they don't have new number of economic projections in May. You know, the Fed, like so many of these other central banks, the RBNZ, the BOE, the ECB, they only like to change policy when they have new staff projections in hand because they like to turn around to the market and say, see, what we're doing is justified. We're not just making this up as we go. That's a relic of the financial crisis. Nevertheless, the next time the Fed has a new set of economic projections is in June. Per the FOMC minutes, the Fed wants to end reinvestment of their asset purchases, of the principal they received back from their asset purchases this year, which makes me think which makes me think that we're probably looking at rate hikes in June and September, and then we're looking at a change in the Fed's asset purchase program and their reinvestment policy in December. The labor market and inflation figures are very much on track to justify that outcome. In fact, if we consider what the break-even pace for jobs growth is right now, It's worth pointing out that, let me just run this number quickly, to maintain the unemployment rate at 4.5% through the rest of the year, where it currently stands. This is from the Atlanta Fed, their jobs calculator. We've gotten three labor market reports for 2017, which means there are nine left, April through December.
if we get the December 2017 non-farm payrolls report, if jobs average 121,000 plus per month for the rest of 2017, the unemployment rate will remain on hold at 4.5%. Even if this was, say, 5%, which is the Fed's natural rate of employment, the U.S. economy would only need to hold on to about 36,000 jobs per month. That's not fast at all. So things are moving along for the Fed. Of course, any signs that the Fed could go ahead and raise rates on a faster timeline would be contingent upon what's happening with fiscal stimulus plans. Fiscal stimulus, of course, if it's looser, then you have deficit spending, government spending up, taxes down. That's exactly what the Trump administration wants to do. You have deficit spending. You get inflationary pressures. Inflationary pressures outside the current band of expectations means the Fed needs to raise rates at a faster clip than they previously had anticipated. That should theoretically support the dollar as nominal and real interest rates move higher. But tax reform is probably pushed back until past the summer recess. It's going to be done in late third quarter or early fourth quarter. 2017, infrastructure spending not happening until sometime in 2018. So that's where we are with the dollar. Things are good, not great. Fed's moving along. Risks are starting to rise. No real reason to see the dollar index break out this week. Perhaps the BOC will give us something to chew on today, although dollar CAD still remains in a consolidative state. Perhaps the Aussie and jobs report will give us something to work with that could push us out of this two-month range, or three-month range, excuse me. But overall, the number one thing to look out for is this rising geopolitical risk and how it's causing in the near term gold, the Japanese yen, and U.S. yields all the one up. And as long as U.S. yields remain weak, the U.S. dollar is going to have uh, trouble rallying for legitimate organic internal reasons. The Japanese yen will continue to strengthen. Gold will continue to remain higher. And ahead of a holiday weekend, a holiday weekend especially where no one is going to be sitting at their desk for maybe up to four days, right? If you're in Europe, you leave work on Thursday, you're not coming back until next Tuesday. That's a wide window for something to happen. Something happens over the weekend you're not there, you want to have taken shelter already. Um, I have discussed most of everything that people have asked about. There's one question in here that I didn't get it to. Um, as we approach the end of a triangle, can the price of a currency pair instrument achieve zero volatility after the end of uh, after reaching the end of the triangle. No, not necessarily. The only type of zero volatility positions that you have are in option markets where um, you, you construct zero volatility collars, right? It's where you buy and and, uh, and sell uh, a call and a put with the same premium so that the premium that you collect on, say, the call side is used to pay for the premium needed for the put side. That's really the only place that you have zero volatility type of trades in FX markets. Zero volatility colors.
as we get to the end of time here in this triangle, for example, let's say we continue to push, 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 we get out to June and prices continue to winnow into this narrow area in the triangle, especially against the rising trend line going back to last year. All right, let's say for some reason this continues to go on and we coil, 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 and we funnel down into the apex here sometime in July. I liken it more to a spring Mets coiling rather than anything else. Volatility has fallen, but we know that past performance isn't indicative of future results. Yes, there's volatility clustering in markets where if you have low volatility, it's likely to result in more low volatility. And if you have high volatility, it's likely to be followed by high volatility. But in FX markets in particular, when currencies go through periods in which prices coil, 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 and volatility falls, 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 it's like a spring coiling in so far that you're storing a lot of potential energy. Okay? And eventually that potential energy is converted into kinetic energy when there is a catalyst outside the norm of expectations because everyone is basically looking at the same exact thing, expecting nothing to happen. Something happens that drives everyone out of the position all at once. Something that almost happened down here in price. Prices are coiling, coiling, coiling. Oops. In this triangle, range is getting narrower and narrower and narrower. And then all of a sudden, bang, we pop outside the triangle. Prices start to rally up very quickly and it becomes a very violent move. In any case, moving away from the theoretical physics analogy, uh, I do see that we have gone on for about 30 minutes plus here, which is our allotted time. As always, I appreciate everyone's time and attention this morning, and particularly on this holiday shortened week. Of course, uh, for the remainder of this week, I will be hosting another webinar. So we talk a little bit more about central bank policy tomorrow morning. Central Bank Weekly webinar due up at 7.30 Eastern, 11.30 GMT. We'd love to have everyone come out there. This, of course, is a review of policies impacting FX markets from the Fed's rate hike cycle to the ECB's recent pushback against the, you know, dovish with a hawkish tilt interpretation of the last policy meeting to what's going on with the BOJ's asset purchase program and what the BOE is doing around Brexit. Of course, we'll be able to talk about what the Bank of Canada is up to as we'll be, have gone through the BOC meeting overnight or later on today here in New York. Other than that, if you want to get in touch with me, feel free to reach out to me through the Daily FX Real-Time Newsfeed stock tweets and Twitter at CVECUFX. You can access the Real-Time Newsfeed by scrolling up to that news banner news ribbon on the uh, Daily FX website and clicking on real-time news. That, of course, will pull you into our real-time news feed. You can always follow me on Twitter, like I said, at CVecchioFX. Or you can email me, CVecchio at dailyfx.com. If I don't speak to you before then, good luck trading the rest of this week. Good luck with your trading through the weekend. Remember, Holiday weekend, lower liquidity, good time to take positions off the table, good time to reduce risk by a significant amount if you're going to be operating at all. Unless you can actively manage your positions, given the geopolitical risk rising right now, it's probably a good time to take a step back and just enjoy the holiday for what it is. Hopefully see you tomorrow, and if not, again, have a great rest of the week.